Hello and welcome to the Talking Roadmaps channel. My name's Justin Woods and I'm one of the co-hosts here. If you're new to the channel, Talking Roadmaps is about all things to do with roadmapping, the art, the craft, a bit of a science in there as well. If you're new to the show, please do have a look down at the description. We have special guests involved and I'm gonna introduce one of those to you today. We're speaking with the one and only Teresa Torres, everybody, welcome. Thanks Justin, I'm excited to be here. And if you find value from our conversation, please do give us a like, maybe subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube and maybe tell a friend and let them share some of the value as well. Just give our listeners a little bit of a background to some of the great work that you do, Teresa. I work as a product discovery coach so I basically help teams make better decisions about what to build. Uh, I teach a customer-centric approach. I teach a continuous approach. Uh, we can get into all of that. Uh, but yeah, really the goal is how do we make sure we're building the right things? Fantastic. Yeah, it really it really is. And it's something that we're, we're definitely passionate about. Um, I'd love to talk with you about some of those because when we talk about roadmaps, I think the scope is, is quite large and a lot of people, I think, narrow down into the, into the wrong types of things. But speaking with uh, the co-host, uh, my co-host, Phil Hornby, we've often talked about things like there should be discovery roadmaps, there should be exploration roadmaps, not just what people often think of as delivery plans. I'd love to explore some of that with you. So maybe we go straight in and, and talk a little bit about um, what is the purpose of a roadmap and what do you feel about a roadmap from, from your experience? Yeah, I think traditionally a roadmap has helped an organization coordinate effort across the organization. So if we look at a traditional roadmap where we've got a list of things that we're building, the dates by which they're gonna launch, what does that allow? It allows marketing to come up with launch strategies and run marketing campaigns. It allows salespeople to tell their customers, um, here's what's coming when, uh, or we're, we're not, that's not on our roadmap, that is on our roadmap, that kind of stuff. And I think what's important is to recognize those needs are real, right? Like we do need to coordinate work across our organization and we do need to tell our customers what's coming and we do need our sales teams to know what's coming and our marketing teams certainly need to coordinate their activities. I think the challenge with that traditional format is that we're not very good at predicting the future. So we tell everybody this feature is being released on this date and then we miss the date. Uh, and that actually causes a lot of harm. So what's nice is that we've seen a lot of iteration and evolution of roadmaps in organizations. And I think we're getting to some better models. Um, but I think I will start by saying if your roadmap is still a fixed list of features with dates, it's probably time to start looking at some alternatives. Oh, totally, absolutely. And in fact, I'd love to visit that. We'll, uh, we'll uh, go into that in a bit more detail later on when we talk about some of the, um, the good and the bad of the roadmaps, because I think we've all started somewhere. I think some of my first roadmaps were certainly look more like delivery plans and project plans. And as I got more experience in the world of product management, I used to be a, a product manager at Dell and at Vodafone in the UK, started to see that there was, that is so far down on the right hand side that actually there's so much more that needs to happen up front of that. You know, if people are thinking their roadmaps are a delivery plan, which is, you know, there's absolutely room for a delivery plan, but there's so much more that comes up front of that. And Teresa, you're one of the people that, that I often think about that are way up front in terms of let's the exploration, the discovery, because by the time we've got to commitment to build, you know, that's where the expense comes in. We should be leading with experiments and curiosity. Um, I think that's certainly something that you would agree with. Yeah, definitely. I, I like to always put things like in their historical context, right? So I think roadmaps started being really delivery focused because organizations used to be really delivery focused. Software used to be a lot simpler. And when software was simpler, it was easier to sit in a room and say, hey, this is what we should build. And we often got it right, right? Uh, I think as complexity has gone up, the amount, the percent of time that we get it right has gone way down. Um, and that's required new methods. So I don't think that the old style roadmap was a bad idea. I think it's just an idea that uh, we've sort of evolved away from because it stopped working. Um, and we're just starting to recognize, like, we can't really predict in January what we should be building in March, let alone July or November. And, you know, I feel like the last few years have been a really good lesson in this. I mean, most teams, if they started the year in 2020 with a fixed roadmap, my guess is by March when we all started working from home and things shut down around the world, uh, there were some changes to that roadmap, right? Now, 
hopefully we don't face a global pandemic most years, right? Um, but we are seeing um, a huge increase in the rate of change in our industry. We're seeing software complexity go way up. We're seeing markets get a lot more competitive. Um, we might be on the brink of a brand new like technology revolution with Web3. I say might because I'm not convinced yet, but I, I hope, um, right? Uh, and so I think that uh, it's not, things aren't going to get slower, things aren't going to get simpler. Uh, we really have to adapt to a more complex world. And that's what I think is driving all these changes in our road mapping methods. Yeah, mass massively. You know, going from the outputs to more outcome-based roadmap is, is really important. And I think that's the transition because nobody roadmapped COVID and, and the pandemic on their roadmaps, uh, on their delivery plans. But, but up front from that, the, the customer problems and the opportunities are still there regardless of a pandemic, right? They're the things that we must solve for our customers. Yeah, I think let's, you, you're introducing two ideas that I think are really important here. So first, when I was working as a product manager and I was thinking about how do I get away from this fixed roadmap, the first thing I iterated to was an outcome-focused roadmap. And a lot of people do that, right? They say this quarter, we're going to work on this outcome. Next quarter, we're going to work on this next outcome. And I think that's a good, actually, I think maybe themes happened before that. Like, we don't know what solutions we're going to build, but we're going to work on these themes. Then eventually themes kind of evolve into outcomes. And I think those are both two really good iterations. The challenges with both of them is we don't know how long it's going to take to deliver a theme. We don't know how long it's going to take to deliver an outcome. So there's still this idea of we can't predict the future. So if we're putting a date on our roadmap, we're kind of saying we think we can predict the future. And if we're getting a lot of evidence, we're bad at predicting the future. Um, and so with the format that I really love is this now, next, later format. And I love combining it with, with outcomes, opportunities, and solutions, depending on how near or far we are, right? So in the near term, what we're working on right now, we probably have both a delivery plan and a discovery plan. And our delivery plan is we have things that we're building right now that we have clarity around the scope, we have clarity around, hopefully we've done enough discovery that we have clarity around how difficult they are to build, and we should have a little bit more certainty, and we might even have a date on which those features are being released, right? Now, in the now column, you probably also have some dis discovery work. So these are the opportunities we're working on right now. And for if you have list viewers that aren't familiar with the word opportunity, it just represents an unmet customer need, pain point, or desire, right? And so we have opportunities that we're working on right now, and we probably have an outcome that we're working on right now. But then when we get into that next column, things get a little blurrier. Like, we may not know what solutions are coming next. Maybe we know what um, opportunities are coming next. Maybe we know what outcomes are coming next. And then everything beyond that in the future is really nebulous and unclear. And I think the really um, other important thing on that now next future um, roadmap is we don't know when we're moving from now to next. Um, and so that format, what I love about it is it represents the uncertainty. It, rep it acknowledges we can't predict the future. Now it still has some problems. The problems are how does our sales team tell their customers what they're doing? How does our marketing team coordinate their activities? And so we lose a little bit of those benefits we got from that original fixed roadmap. Um, but I would argue we never got those benefits from the fixed roadmaps because those dates were never correct. That's right. And it only served often as a, a sword and a shield for the team, whereas, you know, sometimes we'd provide a date to try and be helpful, but that ends up eroding trust. And it was only ever an approximation or a guess anyway. So you're, you're quite right there. Um, makes complete sense to me. And, you know, I think there's a way to fix this problem. And I think really it's this is hard because this is not within product teams controls in control, but I think organizationally there are ways to fix this problem. I would love to see marketing teams not run marketing campaigns based on outputs, right? Like, why are we doing feature launches? What we should be doing is running marketing campaigns about how our customers are having success with those outputs, right? So just like in the product world, we're shifting from an output mindset to an outcome mindset, we can make that same shift in the marketing world, where instead of coordinating all of our marketing campaigns, around we built these outputs, we could coordinate our marketing campaigns around our customers had success with these outputs. And then it's less tied to our delivery schedule. Um, I actually think it's much more effective marketing. Uh, but again, that's not always in a product team's control. So we're sort of in this like uneven 
change in an organization where I really think product teams are leading the future way of working uh, and the rest of the organization is kind of slowly following. And so it's messy because we're not all changing at the same rate. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a fascinating concept and I, I completely agree. It's, it's an evolution of the entire company in many cases led by product because they're at the, the forefront or at least these, these product teams um, or, or even the product trios, as I know that you've, you've talked about before, you know, totally those sorts of teams assembling and going on that journey. But, you know, I've worked on some enterprise transformations where even the customer of that client has had to evolve because they've been used to looking at releases and when are we going to get this new feature? And so even the customer or the, or the customer of the client has to evolve on that. That's um, that's really fascinating. I, I definitely agree with you on that. You know, we have to we have to transition as an organisation many times spearheaded by the product team. Yeah, and I will say when I say product, I don't mean product managers. I actually mean product managers, designers, engineers, user researchers, everybody that's in that sort of product and engineering organization. Right, yeah, totally, and that's a, that's a really good clarification. I wonder if we just bring it back, because I wanted to go down that fascinating rabbit hole there with you, and we'll, we'll pick up on some bits of that as, as well. Um, I wonder if, you know, if we think about the, the roadmap not as being a, um, as a delivery plan, but more around the, the now, next, later. In your view, who's, who's the typical audience of those? And I think we've mentioned some of those already, the marketing team, the engineering team, is it the entire organization, in your view, that's the audience? I think it's not just the entire organization. I think there are situations... Well, so first, I do think it's the entire organization. And I think there are situations where it even makes sense to share that with your customers. And we have some really great examples of companies sharing their roadmaps with customers. And I think sometimes that can be dangerous. If you're promising a feature on a specific date, and then you learn that's the wrong feature to build, you just overpromise to your customer. And that's where I think that now, next, later format... And, and changing the fidelity of how close to the future it is um, really helps with setting appropriate expectations with customers. But I think that it, when you do this really well, it makes it safer to share this with your customers. Um, and I think that's a really great thing because I, when I buy a product, I want to know where the product is headed. And I think that's a valid need of our customers that we can meet when we get better at road mapping. Yeah, great context. Yeah, it makes sense. And and so who do you think owns a roadmap? Is that is that traditionally within product teams again or or in your view who who owns them? Ideally, I want each product trio to own their own roadmap because that's what empowers them to do good discovery and to reach their outcome. Um so that's a little bit idealistic because unless your team is structured really well, which we're still learning how to do, you're going to have dependencies across teams and you're going to need your leadership to help negotiate those dependencies and those boundaries. But I do know there are organizations that do work in this ideal way. It's not fictional, um, where each team truly is empowered. They have their own outcome. They each have their own roadmap. When you're communicating to customers, if you have 40 teams, you don't want to communicate 40 different roadmaps. So there's a little bit of a rolled up view that somebody has to manage, right? Um, and usually that's the leadership in your product and engineering organizations that are doing that work. But yeah, like I, I really want to see teams move towards every team owns their own roadmap because otherwise you're not an empowered team. Yeah, yeah, and that would be amazing. Um, I've, I've worked in positions where I've, I've been more of a delivery manager than I have a product manager. So these, these sorts of conversations and concepts really excite me. And I think we need more of that. I'm excited by where I'm seeing the industry going, Teresa. From your perspective then, if we, if we talk about the roadmap in the sense that we know it's not the delivery plan. We're thinking of it more as the now, next, later. We're thinking more about some of the opportunities that we're wanting to uh, to explore. Um, what's the relationship of that roadmap to vision and strategy and some of the higher level strategic um, type entities in your view? What's, how does that work? Yeah, this is where language is hard. I, you know, we often use vision, mission, strategy, strategic objectives, outcomes, OKRs to all mean the same thing. And I don't think they're the same. There are some meaningful differences. I'm not sure that off the cuff I can define them in a meaningly accurate way. Um, but I think for a lot of teams, several of those elements we just mentioned are missing. And I actually, I think that's where we're still seeing um, a need for a lot of maturity in our product and engineering leadership. I see this especially on the engineering side. I don't want to pick on engineers in particular because we see a a gap on the product and design side too, but um, we really need organizations to say, this is who we are, this is what we're trying to do. And that's sort of where we get into that vision, mission, strategy stuff. Strategy starts to get into the how, 
but we want to make sure that we're not getting so far into the how that we're prescribing solutions. And I still think we need good examples of what this looks like. Um, this is actually something that uh, my instructor team has been talking a lot about, uh, and we might be working on, I, I know not to promise future products, uh, but we are exploring a future product in this space. We'll see if it comes to fruition. Um, of just providing really good examples. Marty Kagan talks about it as strategic context. What does that look like? What does it look like to define your organization's strategic context? I know that um, Petra Villa does a lot of work in this space, and I know she has some really great ex ideas and includes several examples in her book, Strong Product People. Um, but I think for a lot of teams, it's totally absent. And because we've never seen what good looks like, we don't even know what to ask for. And I think for a lot of leaders, They've never worked somewhere where, where this was in place, and so they don't know what to give their teams. So I think this is a giant gap in our industry, and I think it's one that we desperately need to fill. Yeah, absolutely. One of, one of the reasons I got into, into road mapping, and as a, as a product manager, I needed to be able to, leading a team, I needed to be able to kind of define strategy at my portfolio level, but then show how that tied into corporate strategy and that's where it fell apart you know my team were looking to me for strategic guidance and I was looking for the next tier that that didn't exist and so I I um, ended up implementing a road mapping tool called aha in in there and then I joined aha for three years but really I, the reason I implemented it largely was to demonstrate that I didn't have that strategic alignment I didn't it was just not defined and and you know strategy and that strategic constant um, context sorry is so motivating it's so important for alignment and, and when it's not there it shows and I think that's going to make or break the companies of today and certainly tomorrow is that clear strategic definition the ones that don't have that, I think, are the ones that are going to really suffer. Yeah, and I think, I really think we're just, we need to get more precise in our language. So I think, like, we do have some good examples of good visions. Like, the one that people refer to a lot is Dropbox. Dropbox created this three-minute video that was phenomenal at painting the picture of what would it look like to have access to your files from anywhere. Right? They didn't talk about the how. Like, you didn't watch that video and go, oh, I know exactly what Dropbox is going to build. But I did say this is exactly what Dropbox is going to do for me. That's a phenomenal vision, right? But then there's, OK, now we have a business model. How's Dropbox going to get, get, make money? So your business model is a place in here as well, right? And then you could have a Dropbox with that vision that has a totally different business model than maybe a box that has the same vision but different business model. So now we're talking about different strategies Right? You could even have the same company, the same vision, the same business model, and different strategy, because strategy is getting into like how we're going to realize this vision. And that, I think it's strategy is the hardest because it's where people want to like prescribe what the product is going to do, because we are starting to get into the how. Um, but what I love is we're starting to get some good examples of strategy. I think the book, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, is a really great place to start. Because um, it gives you sort of a, a framework for thinking about how do we diagnose what's happening in the market, which is a really great place to start. So we're starting to get a little more clarity around these things. Um, but I think we're like in the on day one of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it, I, I feel the same. Um, you know, I see it working with the clients that I do, doing uh, transformations and implementing road mapping tools. Um, a lot of the time when we're trying to identify that, again, there's so many different words and terminologies and frameworks here, but at the end of the day, it's like, well, what do you have? And, and sometimes they're trying to retrospectively do that. You know, sometimes you see a, a product team that's trying to turn into more of a, a, a solutions team, or they're just trying to retrospectively take product strategy and make that a company strategy. So I'm, I'm really seeing that a lot with the, the people I'm working with. Yeah, this is where, so company strategy is interesting too, because that's a whole different level. So if I think about a single product, it has a business model, it has an ideal customer, it has some, if I have a business model, I can put metrics around it. Hopefully there's a vision for that product. And so I can come up with a product strategy. I know that's new for a lot of people, but like that's one sort of constrained realm. Now, if you're a big company, for a lot of small companies, you have one product. Your product strategy is your company strategy. But as you get bigger and you have a portfolio of products, now there's a whole nother layer of strategy, which is your portfolio strategy, your company strategy. Um, and that's where things get even more complex. Fortunately, I don't think most individual product teams have to deal with that. They have a little bit of time in their career to kind of learn about product strategy before they have to worry about 
portfolio or corporate strategy, but they're all really important. And I think keeping all of those things aligned is really challenging. Yeah, yeah, massively. Oh, that's a great conversation. What do you, um, we talked about, I want to go into kind of the design of a roadmap a little bit. And you, you alluded to the, the now, next, later, which I have certainly picked up and embraced in my career. I think it's a great way of doing things and actually allows you to have much more of a transparent conversation, more of a meaningful, trusting conversation with your stakeholders. But what do you, what would you um, think are some of the key elements or content on that roadmap? Um, for yourself, if you if you see a good example or a, an example that you like to share with people. Yeah, so I think we have three basic components that we work with as a product team. We have outcomes. These are the metrics we're trying to drive. Ideally, I want to see outcomes be a mix of two things. I talk about business outcomes, which should be derived from your business model, right? Every for-profit company is trying to grow profit. The way they do that is by either increasing revenue or reducing costs. The way that we increase revenue is we look at our business model formula and we increase the inputs in that formula, right? So like a really simple example, if I'm a subscription business, my input variables are things like uh, increase uh, number of customers, increase their average spend, increase their retention. So that's giving me this idea of what outcomes matter to my business. Now, business outcomes are really hard for product teams to work with because we don't directly influence them. But we directly influence our product outcomes. And product outcomes measure a customer behavior that occurs within the product. And so what we're looking for is what are the inputs, what are the customer behaviors in our product that we believe will drive those business outcomes. So I like to think about it as product outcomes are leading indicators of business outcomes. As product teams drive product outcomes, they create value for the business. So that's one sort of atomic element that we work with as product teams. The second one is opportunities, and opportunities represent customer value. So they're unmet customer needs, pain points, and desires. And we're looking at like, how do we positively intervene in our customer's world, right? So how do we create something that solves a need, solves a pain point, solves a desire, um, but in a way that drives that business outcome? Um, so that's sort of our second atomic unit. We have out, one is outcomes, two is opportunities. And then the third is our outputs, it's our solutions, it's the features that we're building. And I think the key here is to keep all three of those things aligned. Um, and so I have a visual called an opportunity solution tree that helps teams keep those three things aligned, making sure that as we explore solutions and we start to fall, get, fall into shiny object, object syndrome, that we're focusing on the things that will create customer value in a way that will drive business value. And I think it's those same three atomic units that I want to see on a roadmap. So in the now column, I'm going to have some solutions that are currently in development that I already have confidence in that I probably can even put a release date around. I'm going to have probably a target opportunity where I'm exploring new solutions. I definitely don't have target dates around that. Um, I might have my current outcome that I'm working on. Um, and then in my next column, depending on where I am on my current outcome, I might have the next opportunities I want to explore on that outcome, right? So if I'm trying to have a big impact on my outcome and I'm in a really early stage of impacting that outcome, then I probably don't have another outcome in my next column because I'm going to work on that outcome for a while. And so what I have on my next column is more opportunities that support that initial outcome. Now, if I've worked on my outcome for a long time and I'm pretty close to reaching my goal, I might have a new outcome in my next column. Right? I'm pretty close to reaching my goal, and once I do, I'm going to move on to this next outcome. So that next column for me is usually a mix of outcomes and opportunities. Maybe it has a solution or two if I already have clarity on what we're building next, but I would say most of the time it does not. And then the future column is usually an outcome. Maybe if I'm at the very beginning of working on an outcome, it might also have some more longer term opportunities on that outcome. I love that answer. I'm, I'm visualizing it in my head as you, as you narrate and, and paint the picture there. But one of the things that, that strikes me, and, and again, I don't think people do this enough, is actually to put activities on the roadmap that say, hey, we're going to do some exploration. We're going to do some discovery on these things. Because I think people are often used to just, what are we building? And that's, it's, it just forces that output mentality again. I think showing that we're consuming some time to be curious and actually delve deeper into the why 
um, really appeals to me. I'm, I'm a former business analyst and I used to get frustrated when it, we used to throw technology at the solution all of the time. And actually, sometimes it was a change in process or a change in something else. And it's not always building is the solution to a problem. So I'm loving that, that we should show that we're dedicating time to these things on our roadmaps. The other thing this does is it helps to chip away at this problem of how do we communicate to the rest of the organization what we're working on. So if I'm in marketing, I want to know what's releasing when. But, and I'm going to get that in the near term, right? But I still benefit from knowing you're going to solve this customer problem next. You're going to be exploring this customer problem next. Because I can start working on campaigns around what would it look like if we solved that? How, how would I run a campaign around that, right? And so again, if we shift our marketing to be less about we released an output and more about we're having this impact on our customers' lives, I can start looking for like, what customers do I know have that pain point today? How do I reach out to them? How do I get them queued up to, to one, help test those solutions with my product teams, but also be open to sharing their story of the, as they have success with those solutions, right? So it still actually helps our sales team if they know we're gonna solve that opportunity next. When they're talking to prospects, they can be like, look, we don't currently address this problem, but I know our product team is exploring it right now. Would you like to talk to them? It's a great way to win business and it's a great way for product teams to get access to customers that have that problem. Yeah, massive, massive. And I, I wish product teams would do more of this, which is talking to customers. <laughs> you know, I don't think they do it enough. And, and um, you know, being able to, to show that we're, we're doing that builds relationships with the customer. You know, I've, I'm privileged to have started up my company in just three, three or four years ago, and I'm still formulating what my mark, product market fit looks like, what my ideal products and services look like. But being able to speak directly to my, to my clients and product manage them as I'm building the company, it's an absolute gift. And so I think, you know, having that is, is, is just building stronger relationships that are much more meaningful and means that we can actually understand the true uh, solutions to these opportunities. Definitely, definitely. That's brilliant. And I'm, I'm curious, um, are there any tools that you prefer to use for managing and visualizing roadmaps? Do you like something that's very flexible? What, what do you typically go to? You know, I try to stay out of the tool recommendation game. Here's what I'll say, we have a lot of tools a lot of tools. Like if we think about road mapping, we have like AHA and I'm sure Atlassian has a number of products and uh, prod board and prod plan. And we could just enumerate a million tools here. I think they all do different things well. And I think every team has different needs. So just like anything in product, it's about evaluating a solution based on your identified needs. So like if I was on a product team and I was trying to pick a product manage, a product roadmap tool, I would actually create an opportunity solution tree of my needs, right? Like, what are my team's needs for a roadmap? How do I map out that opportunity space? And then I would evaluate those tools based on how they serve those different needs. Um, because I don't think there's like one best, I don't think it's possible for there to be one best tool. Um, I think it's really about finding the right tool for the right team. I love that answer. How good is to actually use the opportunity solution tree to, to find your ideal you know, road mapping tool? We've had such a variety of answers to, to that question. And you, know, you may think I'm biased coming from a tools background, but some of my favorite are the ones that are flexible enough that allow you to show exactly what you need. I think there's always a balance of a single version of truth versus, so a tool that kind of manages that versus the flexibility of showing exactly what you need. And, and maybe we'll talk a little bit uh, a bit later about the, the different views of, of roadmaps, because I think the roadmap, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, is a, is a communication tool and alignment tool. It needs to serve its purpose by communicating directly to each audience, and each audience's needs are going to be different. So that's a great answer, Teresa. I think that's a, a golden nugget right there. I think also, you know what, we're in an era where like tool interop ability is getting better. And so I also would say, you don't always need to use one tool to serve all needs, right? So like your product teams might need a tool that supports their own work. It might be a different tool that's best at commu for communicating. I think if you're gonna use different tools, you wanna make sure that data is syncing automatically and you're not asking your teams to re-enter the same stuff over and over again. Um, but you know, we've got good tools for that now. Like a lot of these tools are integrating with each other. We have tools like Zapier, that help us automate integrations. Um, if you have some dev time to throw at the problem, you might even be able to use some of these tools APIs to do that. Um, so that's the other thing. I see a lot of teams try to use one tool for everything. 
and no tool is good at everything. What do you consider to be a best practice in road mapping? And I think we picked up on some ones that were kind of things to avoid and we both share those. But what, what would you like to see as a best practice on the road map? Don't over promise, I think is the, is the short of it. I think that's where roadmaps cause more harm than good. Um, we, and I think it comes out of a good place. Like we want to give people what they need, um, but we have to recognize that sometimes we have to share hard truths. And I think it's much better to give a realistic view of where you are. Um, even if that's, hey, we're exploring this opportunity, but we don't even know if we're gonna find a solution that will work. We might have to throw the opportunity away. And I know that creates a lot of uncertainty in the organization, but that's realistically where we are right now. Right, absolutely. And in fact, I loved your, your, your talk earlier about what you are mentioning about um, having good examples of what good looks like, because I certainly remember when I started off as a product manager, I, I searched for roadmaps in, in Google or search engine, and what you get back is Gantt charts. So you then go, oh, well, that's what's expected of me. And I'm just like, you know, now it's just like, can we just clear all of that, please, and start again? So I, I love that, that, that concept that you just shared. Um, what do you think are some of the biggest mistakes people make in road mapping? You know, it's a, similar to what I see with outcomes. Sometimes leaders define the roadmap on their own and they just hand it to a product team and we basically have a delivery team. But sometimes product teams define their roadmap with no input from the rest of the business and I think that's equally bad, right? So I think we want to make sure that we're always collaborating and so there's the easy collaboration of, I mean, it's not easy, but there's the like simple collaboration of collaborate with your trio and your team and make sure you're empowered and, and working together on what you should be building. But there's also collaborating up. So this probably falls under managing up of like, are you on the same page as your leader? Do you know what your leader expects from you? Are you creating the right value for the business? So do you have right alignment between your product outcome and your business outcome? And then there's also collaborating across the organization. So are you helping your sales team and your marketing teams understand what's coming? And where they are. Are you working with finance to make sure that you're not creating a finance nightmare um, down the road? Uh, you know, compliance, legal, all of it falls into the same category. And so I think it really is making sure that you are not creating your roadmap in isolation. Yeah, massively. Again, cast in my mind back, you know, I remember my first roadmap being locked away in a business room, uh, trying to take all of these inputs. It was a solo effort. It came out as a delivery plan and then you go and hang yourself with it. And it was just like, you know, looking back now, it could you know, it's, it was what it was. But from what I know now to, to what I knew then is massive difference. And in fact, I, I'd love to explore with you a bit more of, of the opportunity solution tree. Do you have a pet hate to see on the roadmap? Not really. Like I know some people say they hate seeing dates on a roadmap at all, and I don't think that's realistic. There's always times, there's always, you know, we got a big conference coming up, we wanna release a new feature to support that conference or whatever it may be. You're bringing on a big new customer and they need to launch with something new. There's lots of reasons why we might need to have fixed dates. Um, I think we over rely on that. That's, I think that's sort of a concern. But I can't, like I, I don't have a um, never do this type rule for roadmaps. In fact, I think I always try to avoid, actually, I just said always, which is funny because I was going to say I always try to avoid never and always. Oh, that's great. I, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, there's, again, just getting these good examples of roadmaps into the hands of people so they can see what good looks like. Um, and, you know, a, a good diagram of that. And actually, that reminds me of the, the, the bit that I wanted to come back to you on, which is that I've seen a couple of great examples of opportunity solution trees. And, and I wondered if you'd talk to us about some locations where people can go and learn more about those as well. Yeah. So if you go to producttalk.org slash opportunity solution tree. We'll put a link in the description. And if you're on the podcast, have a look at the website. But um, yeah, Teresa, carry on. Uh, so that's where we collect all of our articles about the opportunity solution tree. Here's what I'll say about this tool. It looks really simple and um, it packs a lot of power. The challenge is what I'm learning after having written the book, we also teach a course on opportunity mapping. It's a hard tool to learn how to use well. So if you're new to it and it feels really simple, um, you're probably missing something. Uh, and second of all, if it feels really hard, that's normal. It really, like this is a synthesis tool. It's helping you really synthesize what do we learn in our interviews? How do we make sure we're how, how do we make sure we're creating value for our customer in a way that creates value for the business? And I will share some of the common mistakes I see teams make. The opportunities on your opportunity solution tree should come from customer stories. Full stop. 
That is the only place this should come from. We can have a lot of conversations about why this is important. So the biggest mistake I see teams do and is they go in a room and they create an opportunity solution tree just based on what they think or based on what their stakeholders think. Uh, I guess there's some value to that. There's always value to externalizing your thinking and aligning around it, uh, but you're missing most of the value. Most of the value of an opportunity solution tree is we're trying to mine gold from our customer stories, right? And so if you're not collecting those customer stories, um, if you're, you're not getting the vast majority of the value from it. The other place where people really struggle, and I'm still learning how to teach this better, is just what's the difference between an opportunity and a solution. And again, it's so easy to say, well, an opportunity is a need or a pain point or a desire. Uh, but I looked at enough people's trees to say, oh, those are all solutions. And it's, I feel like I'm in a tough spot because I love that people are starting to blog about how they're using it and we're starting to get examples. They're not always great examples. Uh, so one of the things that I'm doing, we do have a Slack community where people are sharing their work and we're giving feedback on that work and we're trying to create better examples and we're showcasing other people's work. Um, if you wanna learn about that community, that's at members.producttalk.org. But we're also taking some of those stories and we're sharing them for free because that community is a paid community. We're sharing them for free on Product Talk as part of our product in practice series. Uh, just trying to create better examples. What's hard is that most people, when they do a good job of mapping out the opportunity space, this quickly becomes proprietary knowledge. They don't wanna share it, right? And so what I've been working on as a little side project is I am starting to interview people as if I worked at a big name company um, about their usage and trying to create good examples of interviews and good examples of opportunity solution trees. And since I don't actually work at those companies, it's not their proprietary knowledge. I'm the one that found it. Uh, so I will be creating better public examples of what good opportunity solution trees look like. Um, I did share one in the book. So in my book, I did walk through my book, Continuous Discovery Habits. I did walk through a pretty detailed example for a streaming entertainment company. Um, but probably over the next year, I will be producing a lot more of those examples because it is a big gap right now. Fantastic. Well, I, I know that um, I remember that example. I think it was increased viewing hours or the, or the viewers at the top as, a, as an opportunity. Um, and then the solutions down. What, what really changed the game for me was that you know, you can fall into the trap of when you get a lot of ideas or customer requests coming in, you take them as solutions and then you go and build them. And actually you need to look at that. And, and, and obviously there's, again, lots of great tools that give us a score and you take the top scoring one and you go build it. But it's not, you're not scratching the surface of what the real customer problem was. And that's really, for me, what the Opportunity Solution Tree helped me to realize, coupled with my experience of being a business analyst, was like, what, it, what is the actual opportunity here? What do we really, what's the bigger thing that we're missing? And it's not just prioritizing ideas there. So I love that we're gonna get more examples from you. Um, guys, if, you, if you're curious, please do go and check out Teresa's website um, and maybe even consider joining the community there as well, because I think that's gonna be a fantastic resource. Yeah, and we do, we have shared a number of stories about opportunity mapping at Product Talk. So if you go to producttalk.org um, slash blog, one of our categories is called product and practice. What that category is, we're sharing stories of real product teams as they put different discovery habits into practice. Um, and we've done a number of them on opportunity mapping. So in fact, we just published a recent one with Trivago, where Trivago is this travel company. Um, they've been around for a long time. They've had product market fit for a long time. They've done a great job of optimizing their product. And they had a team that was focused on like improving the quality of search. And they felt like it was actually really hard to find ways to improve because it's been optimized for years. Um, and they started conducting story-based interviews and they started identifying opportunities. And they, it's just a story about how opportunity mapping really helped them find new areas to innovate in. Um, we have another story with this company, Sira. Uh, Sira is based, I think, in the UAE, but they serve Saudi Arabia and they're a travel company. And it's a story about how, what happened to their company at the start of the pandemic when all travel ground to a halt and they basically saw their business fall off overnight. Um, and it's just a story about how they used opportunity mapping uh, to quickly pivot and to, and to thrive uh, during a really tough time. Um, and I think that is the power of opportunity mapping is that we, um, no matter what is happening in the world, no matter what stage our product is at, 
whether we're going from zero to one or whether we're a 20 year old mature product, uh, there are always customer opportunities we could be solving. 100%, phenomenal. Absolutely love that. I knew um, about the Trivago one. I'm, I'm interested to learn more about the other ones. So I'll go and check that out. Um, in terms of where you get your inspiration and you get your ideas from, um, who, who stands out in the industry as being uh, someone that you get your road mapping advice from or any resources that you use? I'm curious because you're one of my go to. So I'm wondering where do you go for some of your um, your road mapping resources? That's a really great question for road mapping in particular. Um, I think Jana Basto does some really good writing on this. I think Bruce McCarthy and C. Todd Lombardo have a great book on this. Um, Oh, road mapping in particular. I that like that specific focus is hard for me. Um, Melissa Perry always writes really great content. I'm not I can't remember if she has content specifically on road mapping, um, but I really respect the work that she's doing. I you know, I also want to share that I think people read or like read or listen too narrowly in our field, right? So we have a lot of great product thinkers and I'm not going to poo-poo any of them. Um, I think there's a lot of great work in this space. But I also think we can benefit a lot from broader business research and business literature and business books. I think we also can benefit a lot from like decision making research and problem solving research. So whenever I'm asked about like who, what, where do I draw inspiration? <clears throat> for me personally, a lot of it is beyond the product world. Um, not that I don't get inspiration from people within the product world. I absolutely do. John Cutler uh, is another person who is constantly throwing out uh, really just innovative thinking. Um, but I also want to encourage people to, to, to look outside of product as well. Yeah, I love that. If we had a, a guest on recently, or it's one that I, that I watched, who got their inspiration from film sets and, and directing and things like that. And I thought that was fascinating. And there's a lot of parallels to this because a lot of product management is good storytelling and, and, and kind of those sorts of things. So I think that's a wonderful answer, actually, is that, you know, there's always the classics, but thinking outside of that as, as other innovative ways of being able to um, take one learning from one space and apply it to product and road mapping. You know, you mentioned storytelling, and I think the reason why storytelling is becoming so popular in the product world Product people don't want to hear this, but a big part of our job is sales. And it's not sales to customers, it's sales to our internal stakeholders. And nobody, I mean, people who aren't in sales tend to think sales is this dirty thing. And so there is a book that I'm going to recommend. It's called To Sell as Human, and it's by Daniel Pink. And it's just, he just writes about how all of us, 100% of humans, are sell, are selling. Right? We sell to our spouses, we sell to our children, we sell to our friends and family. Like we're selling, we're try we're constantly trying to influence behavior. And I think that um, he does a really good job in that book making that argument and removing some of that like negative view from this idea of sales. And I do think it's a really critical skill and particularly related to road mapping. Love that. What a great recommendation. It's one that I've read, so I need to go and reread that one. It was a while back now, but I think that's I think that's fab. If you had to distill your philosophy of road mapping into a couple of sentences, how would you describe it? For good road mapping, I think it's all about how do we communicate what we're doing and when without glossing over the uncertainty and the ambiguity that we all face looking to the future. It would have taken me so many attempts to even get that one right, Teresa. That was gold right there. And again, you know, a lot of us watching or me right now nodding along with that, I think that's a fantastic answer. We're going to definitely quote that one in the episode. I think it's the back half of that definition that's the hard part, right? How do we give a clear picture of the ambiguity and the uncertainty that we face? And I think this is where traditional roadmaps have really fallen short. We make it look like the world is certain and not ambiguous. Um, whereas I think our more recent methods are starting to acknowledge we need to visually represent this in some way. That's right. And, and, and it's exactly that that we're embracing on the channel as well, trying to um, be able to correct some of those uh, that misinformation and those anti-patterns to be able to show people as a different way. And Teresa, you've definitely helped us with that. Uh, Bruce McCarthy and C. Todd Lombardo, when they were writing um, Product Roadmap that we launched, they reached out because they wanted to include my opportunity solution tree in their book. So they were telling me about their book and my first response was like, really? You're writing a book about roadmaps? And I like, because I was thinking like, aren't we over roadmaps? 
Um, and actually in talking with them, it made me really realize like we are not, we're never going to be over roadmaps. Roadmaps have a very distinct need. Um, and it's really about how do we evolve the roadmap. And I think they have done the industry a great service with their book. And I think there's lots of tools that are now helping us realize some of those ideas. Um, and so I'm excited about roadmapping again. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's fantastic. I love it. Teresa, um, it's been wonderful chatting to you. I'd love to give you an opportunity just to share with our viewers, and we've, we've obviously talked about it at, through today's episode, some different links there. But please, for people that aren't familiar with you, um, let us know kind of what it is that you do and, and pitch your offering. Let, let, let them know how they can get in contact with you. Yeah, so the easiest way to learn more about what I do is just go to producttalk.org, and that's where I blog. Um, I've written over 200 articles. They're mostly long-form how-to articles or uh, just showing how other teams are working type of articles. We definitely try to, our editorial philosophy is show, don't tell. Um, and then uh, I did write a book called Continuous Discovery Habits. It's available paperback, Kindle, Audible, so whatever your learning style is. Um, and then for folks that need help putting the book into practice, we have a number of resources I mentioned our online community. It's a mix of Slack uh, plus live Zoom calls. It's a ton of fun. Uh, you can learn about that at members.producttalk.org. And then we have a variety of online courses designed to help you build skill in the different discovery habits. Uh, and you can learn about that at learn.producttalk.org. Fantastic. What a, what a great resource. Um, I think that's an you know, incredible uh, information for people that are just learning, they're pivoting away from roadmaps in the old space, or they're trying to pick up tips on, on how to approach new product management and new ways of working. I think that, that's phenomenal. Teresa, I want to thank you massively for, to, for being with us today, for so graciously spending your time. I've absolutely loved it. For the viewers out there, I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Um, please do like, follow, and share. If there's something that we've both talked about that you think somebody in the organization could hear and, and learn from, maybe somebody in marketing on the new ways that we're going to interact with them, send the link over to them and let them watch it. And please, if you'd like to get in touch um, to take, take part and be where Teresa is, then drop a note in the comments or email us. But uh, Teresa Torres, what a fantastic uh, privilege it has been to speak with you. Thank you so much. Justin, thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah.